and let's talk about truth tables for propositions. And let's talk about symbolic propositional logic. And let's talk about, well, something terrible in philosophy of language, I suppose. Okay, let's begin with some review. This is our next step in the study of proposition logic or statement logic. And, well, let's let the review that turns up in my notes just happen. Let's do it. Sometimes proposition logic is called statement logic. Sometimes it's called modern logic. This branch of deductive logic analyzes arguments by looking at the basic units of an argument that are its statements or propositions, not terms as uh, in categorical logic. Proposition logic has been most examined in the modern era, primarily. The ancient Stoic philosophers did develop a system of proposition logic. Uh, this is not exclusively a modern thing. It's just been emphasized in the modern era. There is a third deductive system, system branch. I don't know. I think I like the word branch. I'll let system stay. A third system of deductive logic called predicate logic, which combines the advantages of proposition logic and categorical logic. Uh, we are probably not studying it in this playlist. And I don't know if you have a symbolic logic course last semester, uh, next semester, but uh, available next semester. I don't think I do, but apparently I did at some point in the past expect to teach one when I had uh, typed up some notes about this. All right. A compound proposition is a proposition that has at least one other proposition as a component. A simple proposition is a proposition that does not have any other propositions as a component. Keep in mind, a negation is a compound proposition. The statement, um, there are five chocolate candies in my left hand is a simple proposition. The statement, it is not the case that there are five chocolate candies in my left hand the statement, there are not five pieces of chocolate candy. Blah, start again. The statement, there are five chocolate candies in my left hand is a simple statement. The statement, it is not the case that there are five chocolate candies in my left hand is a compound statement because it's made of the first statement. If a statement is made of any other statement besides itself, then it's considered a compound statement, even if there's only one. A statement with just one statement it's made of that's not identical to itself, is a compound statement. A simple statement is one that is not made of any other propositions. A compound proposition is one that's made of at least one other proposition. All right, so negation is a compound proposition. Rookie mistake to not understand that. I've done it myself. We will have to learn how to symbolize arguments in everyday language that use proposition logic. This will prepare us to learn three of the most powerful methods in existence for testing whether an argument is valid. Let's say, let's just say, This will prepare us to learn the very good method for testing whether an argument is valid, which is the truth table method, because uh, you can consider the abbreviated truth table method as a variation of the truth table method. And the third method I had in mind there, the proofing method, I don't even know if I'm going to get to proofing in this series. You could think of what we're about to do here in this way. We're building a symbolic language in order to test arguments more effectively. We symbolize arguments by using capital letters to stand for the simple propositions. And we have connectives that stand for the other things in our compound propositions. And we have five types of compound propositions that uses one of these connectives. We're going to learn hopefully all of them in this particular video. Now, I realize I'm talking about a lot of stuff. And I run this terrible risk of not talking about it very clearly because there's so much and I'm not pausing to explain everything or not talking about it clearly because I do pause to explain everything and then I just take too long to do it. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause the recording, drink some of this and pray for a clear head as to what I should do next. All right, I think I got it. I'm just going to summarize a few things using my own words off the top of my head without looking at these notes very much. We're doing statement logic. That means we're testing arguments to see whether they provide good enough support for their conclusion. And specifically, we're interested in that special quality of an argument that we name 
validity, which is a technical term in logic class, not necessarily according to its dictionary usage. A valid argument is one where it's not possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time. In statement logic, we test arguments to see if they're valid by breaking those arguments down into their parts and specifically their smallest statements, their simple statements. And then we have everything else. And we look at the small statements and the everything else that connects the small statements to see if it's a way of connecting the small statements that makes it impossible for premises to be true and conclusion false at the same time, i.e. impossible for the argument, i.e. Uh, impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false at the same time, i.e. it makes the argument valid. If it is one of those special patterns such that the premises can't be true and the conclusion false at the same time, once we symbolize the argument, we just need to do something to show that it's one of those patterns, then we say the argument's valid and we're done. That's, that's all we have to do with an argument in statement logic. Generally, there are always other exercises that can be done if we, if we want to or if our teachers make us. All right. So um, I've just said something about connectives. So let's give an example and let's name what we're talking about. I said in statement logic, we break an argument down into its smallest parts and everything else that connects it. And the everything else, that's what we call the connectives. In the last video, it's what I referred to as the ands, or the ifs, thens. Maybe sometimes the if and only ifs. All right, so the connectives are all the other things that put an argument together. So example, if, this tea is too hot, then I should take it very cautiously and only tiny little sips. This tea is definitely too hot, therefore I should definitely take it cautiously and only very tiny sips. So the atomic propositions in that argument are one, the tea is too hot or very hot or whatever I said, two, I should drink this tea only very cautiously taking teeny tiny sips or whatever however that sentence goes. And the connectives are if and then. Everything else that was logical was if and then. I had some adverbs like um, definitely. Well, you can include that in your atomic proposition or you can set a design, use your own best judgment, whether it was a necessary part of the atomic proposition or whether it was just useful rhetoric. Hopefully useful rhetoric, maybe useless rhetoric, but a lot of rhetoric that's useful for rhetorical purposes is not useful for logic alone. You know, I should do a video on rhetoric sometime uh, not that I'm an expert, but um, make a comment on this video or something. Ask me to say something about rhetoric. What do philosophers say about rhetoric? What's the connection between rhetoric and logic? What does Augustine say about rhetoric? What is rhetoric? Is rhetoric all bad? Why not? And what do you not know about rhetoric? You think you know what rhetoric is? You probably don't. Um, or at least you're probably missing out on a lot of what rhetoric is. And a lot of it's really important, uh, even when it's not logic as such. So use your best judgment as to whether an adverb like definitely is rhetoric or or whether it's part of the atomic statement. I should definitely drink it very cautiously. Is that the atomic statement? Anyway, they, there were two atomic statements, one about how hot the tea was, one about how I should drink it, and the other was, everything else was just ifs and thens. Uh, I have four chocolate candies, and I have a cup of tea. Let's do that differently. I have four chocolate candies. I have a cup of tea. Therefore, I have four chocolate candies and I have a cup of tea. That's an argument. Atomic proposition, atomic proposition, therefore, first atomic proposition and second atomic proposition. The connecting stuff was the and that turned up in the conclusion. Um, either, uh, what was that example I used? It may or may not seem timely when this video comes out. Either Harris will win or DeSantis will win. Harris will not win, therefore DeSantis will win. The connecting stuff is the either, or, and the not. That's the stuff that puts the atomic propositions into the right order and makes the argument valid, hopefully. Okay, so that was just an overview of what we're doing with proposition logic, and we're almost ready to do the next step, but let's keep getting ready for the next step. Well, unfortunately, we have to talk about truth functionality. Uh, well, let's see, what precisely are we defining? We're defining truth value. The truth value of a proposition is its quality is either true or false. Maybe another way of saying this would be uh, simply,
every proposition has a truth value. It's either true or false. That's it. That's what truth value means. The truth value of the proposition, Mark has four candies in his left hand. It's false. The truth proposition, the truth value of the proposition, Mark has four candies in his right hand, is true. But no, it's not true. The truth functional interpretation of compound propositions is a theory about what makes a compound proposition true or false. The theory is that the truth value of a compound proposition depends entirely on the truth value of the simple propositions that make it up. You can see how this is pretty simple sometimes. I have uh, four chocolate candies in my right hand. That's a proposition. I do not have four chocolate candies in my right hand. That's a proposition. The second one is true, and it's true because the first one is false. So a negation is true if the thing it negates is false, and it's false if the thing it negates is true. Here's a proposition. I have four chocolate candies in my left hand. True. Here's a proposition. I do not have four chocolate candies in my left hand. That's false because what it denies is actually true. Or I have four chocolate candies. I have a cup of tea. I have four chocolate candies and a cup of tea. The and sentence statement is true because the both sides of it are true because this part's true and this part's true. But you can see how this would be weird sometimes. We'll get to this in more detail momentarily, no doubt. Um, if the moon is made of green cheese, then I am the king of France. That's true, according to the truth functional interpretation of compound propositions. Because, well, we'll save the details for later in this video, but why is it true? Because when both parts of an if-then proposition are false, we consider the if then proposition true because it's only false when the if then fails which only happens when the if part is true and the then is false which means basically that the truth functional interpretation of compound propositions is a philosophy of language that tells us that a compound proposition is true or false depending on whether its parts are true or false which sometimes makes perfect sense to you and sometimes seems kind of weird because it allows us to say strange things like, it's true that if the moon is made of green cheese, then I'm the king of France. I'm not the king of France. And that has nothing to do with what the moon is made of. Nevertheless, the moon's not made of green cheese. So you can say anything you like um, as the then clause of an if then proposition. If the then clause is the moon is made of green cheese or something else false. So the truth functional interpretation of common propositions is not something I want you to um, believe in for the rest of your life. I don't even care. I think of it as a philosophy of language, but it's super useful for testing arguments for validity, and I don't think for that purpose it will ever fail us. This is a philosophy of language that is uh, very simple. You might think it's wrong. You might think an if-then proposition is positing some connection between if and then. It's not just saying that it's not true that the if is true and the then is false. You might think if then propositions are saying something a little bit more and I don't care at all. You're welcome to think that. I won't try to stop you. But this simple philosophy of language that talks about the truth value, that states that the truth value of a compound proposition depends on the truth value of its parts. This simple philosophy of language will work perfectly for deductive statement logic. And that's all we need it for. So deal with it. We use something called truth tables to illustrate under what conditions or what circumstances a common proposition is true. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment or in a few moments. A proposition variable is a symbol standing for any proposition, whether simple or compound, not for a specific proposition. Oh good, I've already told you this several times, I think. Proposition variables are just lowercase p and q's. In other words, those are the symbols for any proposition, for all propositions, whereas capital letters are the symbols we use for specific simple propositions. So go back and watch the last video if you want more of this. Now we illustrate the conditions under which A common proposition is true or false using truth tables. We'll illustrate truth tables momentarily, but here's something you must know about truth tables. They need the right number of rows. The number of rows is two 
to the power of the number of simple propositions in the proposition to be charted. Now, what we're going to work up to is doing truth tables for arguments, but truth tables for arguments build on truth tables for propositions. So um, let's, let's give a concrete example with specific sentences, specific concrete things. I have four chocolate candies in my left hand. This is my left hand. This is my right hand. Here's a sentence a statement. I have four chocolate candies in my left hand. It's false. Here's a denial of it. I do not have four chocolate candies in my left hand. That denial is true because the thing it denies is false because the chocolate candies are in my right hand. And if I move them over here, it's true that the chocolate candies are in my left hand and it's false that they're not in my left hand. So the denial again is the opposite truth value of the thing it denies. The compound proposition, there are not four chocolate candies in my left hand, is true or false depending on the truth or falsity of the proposition. I have four chocolate candies in my left hand. It has the opposite truth value. Its truth value is made, its truth value is determined by the truth value of the proposition it's made of. And so when one's true, the other's false and vice versa. And that's what a truth table would chart. Let me just go ahead and give you a very rudimentary truth table to work a simple example. Uh, let me think. Da, 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 da. I think we'll need three rows for this very simple truth table. Um, let's see. Let's use a scheme of abbreviation. Uh, C, C for candies. Let's let C equal, there are four There are four chocolate candies in Mark's right hand, 9.47 a.m. on 2 August, 2022. And we're dealing with the compound proposition that denies that proposition. So when the proposition C is true, the denial is false. When the proposition C is false, the denial is true. And right now, uh, left hand, four chocolate candies, still 9.47 a.m. The, um, <laughs> the atomic proposition is true. Its negation is false. Except, um, well, I guess now it's 9.48, so it doesn't apply. Um, well, let's... There we go. It's certainly not true the whole time. So actually... Um, now we've adjusted the proposition. Um, Ta-da, they're in the wrong hand. And now they're just going over here. They're not in any hands. Now it's false that they're in that hand. And um, face palm, I should have said left hand. I was talking about the left hand this whole time, right? Um, it's false that they're in the left hand, therefore it's true that they're not. So anyway, that's that's what a truth table is. It's just a, a charting of the conditions under which an atomic proposition is true. That's what a truth table is for a proposition. Actually, the simplest truth table would be for an atomic proposition, and it would just have this, um, it would just have that one row. That's the simplest kind of truth table, three three boxes only. For a negation, your truth table can be six boxes. That's probably, the, I think that's the second simplest kind of truth table. Truth tables get hellishly complex. We'll, we'll deal with that uh, in maybe two videos down. Um, but this is what truth tables do. They illustrate the conditions under which a proposition is true or false. And we need to learn in this video how to make truth tables for compound propositions. And we're gonna use that truth functional interpretation to do that. And that is what will give us the option of making truth tables for arguments, which is gonna be the best ever way of checking arguments for validity. Cool? Well, I hope it's cool. I actually know it's cool. I just don't know whether we're cool because I don't know if you're following me. I mean, put comments in the, in the comment box if you like, if you're not following me. But I hope rewinding the video and replaying will fix it. All right, so what are we doing now? Now we're going to talk about what are these kinds of compound propositions. I probably already told you this in an earlier video, but we're also learning 
the exciting symbols. Uh, what did I say earlier? We're building a symbolic language. What we're doing here is learning how to build a symbolic language in order to test arguments for validity more effectively. It means we're going to take those, those extra things and learn symbols for them as well. It's great when you can break an argument down into its correspond, into its constituent parts. Um, I have four chocolate candies, I have a cup of tea, therefore I have four chocolate candies and I have a cup of tea. Let C equal Mark has four chocolate candies, let T equal Mark has T, and the argument is C, full stop, T, full stop, therefore C and T. And that's a good argument. It's great to be able to symbolize an argument to that point, but we learn in this video how to use more symbols to test the argument for validity even more efficiently so that we can stop writing if, then, or, and, and things like that, and just use symbols for those connectors. You might be thinking, I don't like that. I want to use the English letter, the English words, if, then works for me. What horrible symbol are you going to use for an if, then? Yeah, I don't necessarily like it either. Um, but it really does make it much easier to test arguments for validity when you when you symbolize all those extra things. All right, so now let's learn how to symbolize. Let's learn what conjunctions are, when they're true, and how to symbolize them. Um, that was a good sentence. We're now learning the five basic kinds of compound proposition. And actually, that's not even strictly speaking true, because um, let me think. I think you can reduce the five to just three, but don't, don't quote me on that. If it's important, it will come up later, if it's important enough. We're going to learn five basic kinds of compound proposition, even though it is possible to go more basic. I think the basic number, the smallest basic number is three. No, wait, 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 maybe it's two, actually. Actually, maybe you can reduce them to just two. But anyway, five is basic enough for our purposes. We're going to learn the five basic kinds of compound propositions and We want to learn what each of these kinds of compound proposition is. We want to learn when it's true, when it's false. How to how to symbolize it for testing arguments for validity. And I guess that was it. So let me let me copy and paste this for all our other compound propositions we're interested in. formatting it's horrible oh my goodness i don't know what's the deal with the formatting here let's try copying and pasting from here and uh we'll just ignore if some of the ugh, some of the lettering doesn't work weird Why does it change the font? I don't, I don't understand Microsoft Word sometimes. All right, so this is what we want. This is ridiculous. There we go. This is what we want to learn for five basic kinds of compound propositions. For biconditionals, Conditionals, uh, 
disjunction, conjunction, and negation. We want to learn what a conjunction is. Beginning with conjunction, we want to learn what a conjunction is, when it's true, when it's false, how to symbolize it so that we can test arguments for validity. And a conjunction is an and proposition. Conjunct is one of the components, and we've already talked about this two videos back. A conjunction is true when both of its conjuncts are true, otherwise it's false. We symbolize with it dot. Now, I should probably take this moment to say there are different symbolization systems in different logic textbooks. Off the top of my head, uh, I think I have seen a different symbol for dot. You could use a plus sign and it would work just fine. I don't know why we don't use the plus sign. There's probably a reason that I don't know. Probably I never knew. But we're going to use the dot. And I don't think you'll be able to use the plus sign unless all the students in your class ask your teacher and your teacher says, sure, I don't care, it's just a symbol, which is probably what I would say, except no, my brain is accustomed to using the dot. So maybe I would say, sorry, my brain won't work with the plus. It's, it's too ingrained. It's too um, accustomed to using the dot. Anyway, mm, let's see. Um, a, remember, we're symbolizing all atomic, sorry, we're symbolizing all conjunctions here. A conjunction is true when its conjuncts are both true and it's false otherwise. But there's four possibilities, so I'm going to need more rows in my truth table. Uh, let me think. How many rows? I think four is all I need. So the P could be true or false, and the Q could be true or false. Now, you could try this. Wait, I do need one more row, don't I? You could try something like this. Just try to go over all the possibilities and hope you got it right, or meticulously check to see if you got it right, but don't. Don't. It's just going to be entirely impossible later on when things get more complex. What you need to do is do it in an orderly fashion. So your leftmost column should have T's halfway down and then F's halfway down. You're, you're filling in four rows. You've got this, um, I don't know what to call it, guide row. We could call it a guide row. And then you've got four rows where you need to describe all the possible truth value combinations for P and Q, for the conjuncts. Well, in other words, if I was... Um, charting a proposition like I have four chocolate candies and I have a cup of tea. There were four different ways the conjuncts could be true or false. It could be true that I have four chocolate candies and true that I have a cup of tea, or they could both be false, or one could be true and the other false or vice versa. So to do this in an orderly fashion, please do it this way. And it's pretty certain that your textbook and your teacher will want you to do it this way. True is halfway down, then false is halfway down for the leftmost column. And then for the next column, for all your trues, do true halfway down and false halfway down. Then for all your s, do true false blah, false way. For your first column, true is halfway down, then false is the next half. For your next column, for the trues in the leftmost column, do true is halfway down, false is halfway down. For the False is in the leftmost column. In the next column, do true is halfway down, and then false is halfway down, and then continue. There are ways of stating this more clearly, but I don't even know how to state it clearly. I'm just telling you, this is the orderly fashion in which you should do it. Your first row should be all trues. Your last row should be all falses in these columns. We can call these the guide columns. That is the technical terminology, as I recall. Um, guide row, guide columns. Uh, let's see, you should have trues only in the first row for the guide columns, falses only in the last row for the guide columns, and it should be true, true, false, false, and then true, false, true, false. But if we had three atomic propositions to symbolize, the first column would be 
true, 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 false, 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 false. Next column would be true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And then the third guide column, the last guide column is always going to be true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And I trust you can work out the pattern without me finding a way to say it more clearly. Anyway, we've got our guide column set up. A conjunct is true only if both conjuncts are true. So filling in the truth table, that. That's what we have, true, and then a bunch of falses. All right, now, what we want to be able to do is take arguments in ordinary language and symbolize them so we can test them for validity, right? That's the whole point of all of this. So here are several ordinary language sentences that can be translated into a conjunction. Ignore all the rhetorical effects of but versus however versus although or versus even though or yet. A sentence like Aristotle was Greek but Cicero was Roman or Aristotle was Greek however Cicero was Roman or Aristotle was Greek semicolon Cicero was Roman or Aristotle was Greek although even though yet Cicero was Roman. All of those are translated as simple conjunctions. Although, even though, yet, but, however, or a simple and, or no conjunction and just a semicolon, those might have important rhetorical effects, or they might clarify an argument in original context. Nevertheless, none of them are important for testing an argument for validity. This is, um, uh, these are just distinctions we don't care about. Translate all of them uh, as a simple conjunct. So you'll symbolize probably something like A for Aristotle was Greek and C for Cicero is Roman. And then you would symbolize the sentence A dot C using that dot symbol. All right, let's talk about negation. What is a negation when it's true, when it's false, how to symbolize it? A negation of a proposition is the proposition which denies that proposition. It's true when the proposition it denies is false and false when the proposition it denies is true. And we symbolize it using the tilde symbol. That is the tilde symbol, this little squiggly thing. You should be able to find it on your keyboards. Oh, um, the dot. If you're going to type your homework, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I have it here. I, I copy and paste. If you're using a whiteboard, it's easy. Uh, some of these symbols, I don't know where you're going to find them. You might have to find them on the internet. I hope there's a good system for finding them. And I hope there are no font issues or software compatibility issues. But the tilde, at least, you should be able to find in your keyboard. So this is really simple. A proposition. An atomic proposition is either true or false. Any proposition is either true or false. And its negation is going to be true or false or false or true, depending on whether the original is false or true or true or false. So I have five chocolate candies is false. So I do not have five chocolate candies is true. So what about it's not true that I don't have five chocolate candies. Well, that's false. What about it's false that it's not true that I don't have five chocolate candies. Well, I think that's true. False that it's not true that I don't have five chocolate candies. Yeah, that's, uh, that's logically equivalent to just one negation. Nevertheless, a tilde tilde P is determined by what a tilde P is, which is determined by what the P is, meaning the truth value of P determines what its denial is, and the truth value of its denial determines what its denial's denial is, and that determines the truth value of its denial, and so on. Anyway, negations are symbolized as tildes. Uh, as, uh, negations are symbolized with the tilde symbol, and here are several variations of how you could find a Sentence in ordinary language that should be symbolized with a tilde. Um, you know, perhaps, that uh, Socrates was the teacher of Plato and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle and Aristotle was the teacher of Theophrastus. Oh, wait, you didn't know who Theophrastus is? Well, that's fine. Most people don't. But you may know that Aristotle was also the teacher of Alexander the Great, who was not called the Great because he was a great philosopher. He was a great general. Um, I don't know if you would say emperor. Certainly a great general. 
Alexander is not a great philosopher. Alexander isn't a great philosopher. It is not the case that Alexander is a great philosopher. It fails to obtain that Alexander is a great philosopher. Alexander fails to be a great philosopher. Um, it's not true that Alexander is a great philosopher. Those are all the same proposition. They're a denial of the proposition Alexander is a great philosopher. All of them would be translated as tilde A, where A stands for Alexander is a great philosopher. Now, disjunction. What is a disjunction? This, again, is something I mentioned probably two videos back. When is it true? When is it false? How do we symbolize it? A disjunction is an either-or proposition. And the components of the disjunction are both called disjuncts. Now, a disjunct is false if both of its disjuncts are false. Otherwise, a disjunct is true. So the truth table for a disjunct would look like this. Oh, and I should type in that simple thing. You could call this the V or the wedge. This is another one you can easily find on your keyboard. Just use a lowercase v. So, um, there are four possible ways a disjunction can go. First disjunct could be true or false. Second disjunct could be true or false. So, set up all those possibilities according to this pattern. Set them up in this orderly fashion. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false, or to be less confusing, first column, true, true, false, false, second column, true, false, true, false. Rookie mistakes to avoid getting all the right truth values laid out in different rows, but not doing it in an orderly fashion. I've seen that. Rookie mistake to avoid not beginning with the right number of rows and not getting them all done in an orderly fashion. Please follow the rules. Uh, if you need me to state the rules more clearly, I don't know. I hope. I hope you don't need me to. I hope you can discern the pattern. We'll pick it up with more detailed examples shortly. But if you need to, I don't know, try, see what I can tell you. Maybe I have it in my notes somewhere. Actually, it might come up in my notes in a later video for abbreviated, for truth tables for arguments. In the next video, it might come up. A more formal statement of what are the rules for how many rows and where you put all the T's and F's in the guide columns. These, again, we can call guide columns. And this we could call the guide row. So anyway, a disjunction is true if both disjuncts are true. Otherwise, it's false. Sorry, now I got that backwards. A disjunct is true if either disjunct is true. Otherwise, it's false there. It's, it's something like the opposite of a conjunction. The conjunction is true, false, false, false. It's true only if both conjuncts are true. A disjunct is true unless both conjuncts are false. True, 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 false. So either I have a cup of tea or I have four chocolate candies. Uh, that's true as long as one of those things is true. If I drop the cup of tea on the floor here and lose my cup of tea most tragically, or I eat one of these chocolate candies. Did I say five? I should have said four. If I eat one of the chocolate candies and then only have three, um, still true, unless both of those things happen at the same time. If I drop my teacup and eat a chocolate candy, then they're both false. Then the statement, either I have a cup of tea, or I have a chocolate candy, five, four chocolate candies. How did that sentence begin? Unless I lose the cup of tea and lose my set of four chocolate candies, perhaps I'm taking away just one, which I might do in any case. Unless both of those things become false, then it's true that either one or the other is true. All right, note that we are treating a disjunction as inclusive. P and Q could both be true. We are not saying that it's false that either P or Q, when both of them are true. Now, you may occasionally encounter a disjunction, which in ordinary conversation, colloquially, is implicitly exclusive, meaning not both at the same time, like uh, either Biden will be president in January 2025 or Trump will be president in 2025, but not both. We can assume that it won't be both, um, unless some very unusual things happen. 
maybe the Constitution itself changing. Um, no, it could be both. If they joined on the same ticket, one was president, one was vice president, and the other was sworn in in the same month. Yeah, it could totally happen. It's just not at all probable. Um, so normally, normally, a sentence like Trump or Biden will be president in 2025, January. Oh, wait, if Trump ran against Biden in 2024 and won, Trump isn't sworn in until January 20-ish, 22, 21, something like that. They could both be president. Biden for 20 days of January, and then Trump for the next 10 days of January 2025. So actually, they could easily both be president. Let's make it February. Either Trump or Biden will be president in February of 2025. It's extremely unlikely that both of those will be true at the same time. And you might say either one or the other, and you mean not both. If you encounter that kind of sentence, again, I recommend you take it as an enthymeme. There's an unstated step. The unstated step is not both. So symbolize it with two propositions, not just one. One proposition, either of them will be president in 2025, 20, February. And the other proposition, not both, it's two, two propositions. We are treating a disjunction as inclusive. P and both can both be true as far as we're concerned. Now here are some sentences in ordinary language that can be translated into the disjunction. Either Socrates is wise or Augustine is wise. You could say Socrates is wise or Augustine is wise, Socrates is wise or else Augustine is wise, Socrates is wise unless Augustine is wise or either Socrates is wise or Augustine is wise or the very simple Socrates is wise or Augustine is wise. All of these would be translated with a simple wedge, uh, capital letter, wedge, capital letter, probably S wedge A. S for Socrates is wise, A for Augustine is wise, wedge for either or. So capital S, wedge, A would be how you symbolize that. Now at this point, we have to say something about punctuation. You have to punctuate symbolic propositions properly. If I give you this P wedge Q dot R, you don't know if it's a disjunction or a conjunction, and it's not both. Well, actually, actually, both are there. There's a conjunction and a disjunction there, but the whole sentence is one or the other and not both. If it's P wedge Q dot R, then it's a disjunction. But the second disjunct is a conjunction. But if it's P wedge Q and R, then it's a conjunction. But the first conjunct is a disjunction. So in other words, you need to punctuate correctly. And you need to remember each of these connective symbols applies to a certain number of propositions. The tilde applies to one statement to its right. The wedge applies to a statement to either side the dots to a statement to either side, and then the other statements we'll get to shortly to, again, statements on either side. And a proposition can only be affected by one connective or acted on by one connective. So the grammatical mistake here, P wedge Q dot R with no parentheses is that Q, the way you're writing it, Q is being acted on by the wedge and by the dot. You, you, can't, you can't do that. But if you put in parentheses, open parenthesis P wedge Q, close parenthesis dot R, then the whole proposition is a disjunction. One of its disjuncts is simply R and that dot acts on the R disjunct to its right and it acts on the p wedge q disjunct to its left and its other disjunct is indeed p wedge q the whole thing but within that proposition p wedge q we have a wedge that operates on p to its right uh, p to its left and q to its right so here is a chart that i think is necessary <laughs> there are these connectives um i don't know i'm trying to make this work I don't think my video panel is gonna ruin this. Why can't I, oh, that's so weird. 
There we go. That should fix it. I want to zoom in as much as I can. And as usual, Microsoft is just being a jerk. Okay, I'm pretty sure you can see this in my... <sighs> you know what? I don't think the video panel is ruining it, but let's just hide the video panel for a moment. Okay, there we go. Here's the connectives we have so far. Tilde, dot, and wedge, or V. One means not, one means and, one means or. The compound proposition they make is a negation, a conjunction, or a disjunction. And the tilde operates on one proposition to its right, and the other two operate on two propositions, one on each side. And you've got to get your parentheses right when you have a compound proposition that's complex enough that you need parentheses. Now let's move on. Our next two compound propositions, we want to know what is a conditional proposition? A conditional proposition is an if-then proposition. The if clause is its antecedent, the then clause is its consequent. Also, the antecedent is a sufficient condition for its consequent, and the consequent is a necessary condition for its antecedent, meaning that if the if clause is true, that's sufficient for the then clause being true, assuming the if then is sentence itself is true. And if the if then sentence itself is true, then the then clause is a necessary condition for the if being true. Because if it's true, if the if then is true, then you can't have the if true and the then false at the same time. So the, the then being true is a necessary condition for the if being true, and the if being true is a sufficient condition for the then being true. Now, a conditional proposition is considered true unless the antecedent is true and the consequent false. That's it. So this is where you might be annoyed by these things, but let's talk about the symbolism, and then if my brain holds up, maybe I'll say, say more about this truth functional interpretation. Or, good, I am going to say more. It'll come up in my notes. That's, that's, a, that's a mercy. All right, um, symbolism. I guess I'm just going to let this happen. I prefer the arrow, which you will find in some textbooks, but it looks like we're using the horseshoe in my notes here. You can symbolize a conditional proposition with this sideways U looking symbol. We call it the horseshoe. And again, you want to lay out your truth tables properly for the guide columns under P and Q. True, true, false, false. And then true, false, true, false. And a conditional proposition is considered true except in that awkward situation where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Now here are some ways you can symbolize a sentence like, here are some different sentences in ordinary language that you should symbolize with a horseshoe. Uh, if you say um, W for the atomic proposition, Socrates is wise. I for the atomic proposition, we should imitate Socrates. S horseshoe W, no, a W horseshoe I. Um, S Socrates is wise. I, we should imitate Socrates. S, W, Socrates is wise. I, we should imitate Socrates. W, horseshoe, I. So there, that's it. If Socrates is wise, we should imitate Socrates. Given that Socrates is wise, we should imitate Socrates. Socrates is wise. Only if we should imitate Socrates. Don't be tripped up by the only if. 
x only if y means the same thing as if x then y. We should imitate Socrates, given that Socrates is wise. Assuming that Socrates is wise, we should imitate Socrates, or um, we should imitate Socrates if Socrates is wise. All of those mean the same thing. All of those should be translated as, should be symbolized as W horseshoe I for if Socrates is wise, then we should imitate Socrates and that's using the symbolization system W for Socrates is wise and I for we should imitate Socrates. Now, this understanding of the meaning of if-then propositions describes the sort of implication known as material implication. And when we talk about the uh, truth functional, interpretation of compound propositions, one thing we're talking about is material implication. Material implication is the relationship among two propositions such that when one is true, the other is also true. And oddly enough, these propositions may not have anything to do with one another. Now, this is a minimal sense of implication, and it is somewhat less than may be meant by an if-then proposition in ordinary language. Like, if you, if I ask my kids, consider this proposition, guys. If the moon is made of green seeds, then I am the king of France. Is it true? They'll probably say it's false because they're expecting an if-then proposition to posit some connection between the two things. There's no connection between the moon being made of green cheese and me being the king of France. But if we use material implication only, it's true. And you can make of that what you will. Know this much, it does make sense in any number of cases. If I tell you, if I were your teacher, and you're taking my logic class, and I tell you, if you do well on every exam, then you will pass my class, then using material implication, my promise to you is going to be false if you do well in every exam and don't pass the class. But in every other possible circumstance, you do well on the exam, you pass the class, you do poorly on the exam, you pass the class, you do poorly on the exam, you fail the class. Isn't what I said true? Maybe there's some issue with you. If you do well on the exam, you pass the class. You don't do well on the exams and you do pass the class. Well, did I tell you you wouldn't pass the class? No, it's true. If you do well on every exam, then you will pass my class. If you do not do well on the exams, you still pass the class. I haven't lied to you. I've just said, if you do well on the exam, then you will pass my class. I didn't tell you what happens if you don't do well on the exam. This totally makes sense for many uses of that language, if, then. If then propositions in ordinary language totally make sense with just this simple material implication. But whatever I said earlier, I should just say again, and then we should just shut up and move on. I think this is an issue in philosophy of language and I don't even care about it at all. And if you care, carry on, carry on carrying. Um, you're welcome to think this does not capture the full complexity of human speech. Fine, you may be right. You probably are right. I probably agree with you, but also I don't even care. This is the kind of implication we're dealing with when we use the truth functional interpretation of a compound propositions. When we say that a compound proposition is true or false, depending on whether its constituent propositions are true or false, we end up with this understanding of if-then propositions. Namely that there's just this minimal sense of implication, material implication. They're true unless the if is true and the then is false. Uh, you could think of it this way. It's got to be true or false. And the only time you can really say it's false is when the antecedent is true and the consequent false. So they're true otherwise. But the most important thing I can say, other than what I've just said, is just this. This is a superb, and I think it's probably even a perfect, the perfect way of working with compound propositions for the purposes of testing arguments for validity. This will serve just fine. This is not maybe a complete philosophy of language. This is not maybe how you want to interpret sentences in, when you're in conversations with your friends and someone says, if something, then something. This is not necessarily how you want to read literature. If Elrond ever said something to Frodo about, if you do this, then such and such will happen. 
you might not want to say that Elrond's remark is true or false, simply depending on uh, the fact that Frodo never did it or whatever. Actually, here's a great one. What if El Elrond had said, if you put on the ring, what if Elrond had said to Sam Gamgee and Rivendell before they even left to, to take the ring towards Mordor? What if Elrond had said to Sam, if you put on the ring, Sam, you'll ruin everything? Turns out, oh, hang on, hang on, let me see. I, I need to get this example right. If you put on the ring, then you'll ruin everything. Now, then suppose Frodo had never been captured by the enemy at the end of the Two Towers, the book, not the film. The movies screwed things up and didn't get things in the right bit of story. Uh, say Frodo was never captured and taken to Kirith Uncle. Sam never used the ring. We still know that if he had put on the ring, he wouldn't have ruined everything because that's, that's not how it worked out. So we would say Elrond was wrong in giving that counsel. But according to material implication theory, Elrond would be, would be right, even if you and I both know he's wrong. So this is not the way to interpret literature. It's not the way to interpret ordinary speech. Sure. It's not a complete philosophy of language. It's not describing how ordinary people think. Fine. There's all kinds of issues with this. I don't care. This is a perfectly sufficient way of testing arguments for validity, for figuring out whether the premises can be true and the conclusion false at the same time. That's what matters in deductive logic. This is a minimal sense of how words work, and it's perfectly sufficient for our purposes in the statement logic subsection of the deductive logic unit of a logic course. That's all you need to know. All right, now let's expand that there chart. Um, we'll just move the video panel to where it's practically invisible. Maximize my Microsoft Word. I think you'll be able to see this. Word is so weird sometimes. Okay, there we go. So here's our chart. And adding this horseshoe to the chart, there's the symbol. It's called horseshoe. It means if then. It makes a conditional statement. It operates on two statements one on each side. Finally, let's talk about a biconditional statement. Biconditional. A biconditional proposition is an if and only if proposition. A biconditional proposition is true if its components have the same truth value, otherwise it's false. Um, it's symbolized by the tri-bar symbol. Oh, I don't think I explicitly stated this yet. I mentioned it, but didn't go, I uh, didn't explicitly state it. The usual alternative symbol for a horseshoe is an arrow pointing from left to right. The alternative symbol for tri-bar is an arrow pointing in both directions. I prefer it, but this is what I have in my notes and it works. The, the tri-bar symbol means if and only if. It operates on a proposition to its immediate, the proposition to its immediate left and the proposition to its immediate right. And it's considered true if its components have the same truth value, otherwise it's false. I do not have notes for typing in a truth table, so let's just do one. All right, um, I think I want three rows and five, five rows, three columns. So here's the truth table for P tri bar Q. And the biconditional is considered true. when the P and Q have the same truth value and it's false otherwise. So when P and Q are both true, P tri bar Q is true. When P and Q are both false, P tri bar Q is true. When P and Q are one true, one false, P tri bar Q is false, which makes sense. It's an if and only if. An if and only if statement is 
true when both sides of it are false and true and both sides of it are true and it's false otherwise. Here are two examples of ordinary language sentences that can be translated into a try bar. <laughs> Let's say if um, P symbolizes Socrates as a philosopher and W symbolizes Socrates seeks wisdom. Here are some propositions that would be symbolized as uh, P tri bar W. Socrates is a philosopher if and only if Socrates seeks wisdom. Socrates is a philosopher if and only if he seeks wisdom. Socrates is a philosopher just in case he seeks wisdom. Socrates is a philosopher given only that Socrates seeks wisdom. Now, much like with our conditional propositions, we're dealing with um, truth functional interpretations here, and we have some more terminology we can use. This is material equivalence. The last one was um, a material implication. This one is material equivalence. And this is the relationship among two propositions such that they have the same truth value. And they may or may not have anything to do with one another. It's considered true that... Um, uh, if the moon is made of Gouda cheese, now the moon is made of Gouda cheese if and only if I am the king of France. They're both false, so they're materially true, meaning only that the combined compound proposition there is, is true unless its parts have different truth values, and they don't, so that's that. And again, this is really not a complete understanding of how language works, you probably are thinking, and that's fine, I probably agree, and it doesn't matter. This is a perfectly sufficient way of analyzing the relationships among propositions for testing arguments for validity. I don't think it will fail. I think it is flawless for that purpose, which is all we have it for anyway. This is not a philosophy of language class. All right, um, and then, we must add to our chart. So here's the complete chart. As I struggled to get it all visible on the screen at one time without zooming out too much. There we go. Here's our chart. We got five connectives. Tilde, dot, wedge, horseshoe, and tri bar. Different textbooks might use an arrow for the horseshoe and a double arrow for tri bar. Arrow pointing left to right for horseshoe. Arrow pointing left and right, double arrow for tri bar. They mean not and or if then and if and only if, making the compound propositions we call negation, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, and biconditional statements. And they all operate on the statements to their immediate left and their immediate right, except for the tilde, which operates only on the statement to its immediate right. So now having said all of that, we have to be able to symbolize arguments using these symbols. And then we want to be able to symbolize those arguments and test them for validity. Now we're working up to, and I, I kept saying it would be in the next video, but it probably won't be. What we're working up to is a new method called the truth table method that we can use on all kinds of awesome arguments and hideous arguments if, if we want to. We can use it on all kinds of arguments. It's an awesome method there. Yeah, that's the way to use the word awesome. The truth table method is awesome among other reasons because we can use it on any dang argument. We can symbolize using these uh, this symbolization strategy. But it might be good to pause and practice with this symbolization strategy and then use the famous forms method. You could think of that as a two-step thing. Practice the symbolization, step one, and then use cool methods of testing arguments for validity once they've been symbolized. I'll probably combine both of those steps in the same video, but I think I really should put it in another video. I'm going to fix this ugly typo, and then I think I'm going to be done. Thanks for watching, and I was going to have more in this video, but it is plenty long already. So I think this next stuff, practice with schemes of abbreviation, and then apply the famous forms method, we'll do that in the next video. So see you then.